Welcome into episode number three of the Boys Collective with KG and Broadus. My name is Kevin Gray, of course, a 105 through the fan across from me is one fourth of the G Bag Nation and Super Bowl winning scout, Brian Broadus. Brian, how are you? Good to see you. Happy Victory Monday to everybody out there, or whenever you listen to this uh, at your leisure. Uh, uh, good to be with you as always, KG. Appreciate it. Uh, it is a Victory Monday as we're recording this. The Cowboys get a 44 to 20 win over the New York Football Giants at AT&T Stadium, their third uh, consecutive win uh, and put themselves now in, I'm sorry, fourth consecutive win, I should say, excuse me. Uh, now four and one sit at the top of the NFC East. Uh, what's interesting about the Cowboys is that the last time they started four and one was back in 2016 when they finished 13 and three and had the number one seat in the NFC. So if you're looking uh, for some good juju, uh, there you go. <laughs> if you're a Cowboys fan looking uh, for some history to look back on, um, Dak Prescott played well, especially in the second half as we jump into uh, our Cowboys Giants recap. As I mentioned, the Cowboys getting a 44 21 Dak Prescott going 22 of 32 for 302 yards, three touchdowns, uh, had a QB rating of 116.9. Ezekiel Elliott goes over 100 yards again for the second week in a row. He had 21 carries for 110 yards. And a touchdown. Amari Cooper, C.D. Lamb got into into the act with a couple of with a cut, touchdown pass catch of their own. And um, I thought, look, it felt a little weird, Brian. The first half, I felt like as I went back and watched the replay that the Cowboys really could have been up maybe twenty four to ten, maybe twenty seven ten, maybe thirty one ten, depending on how they uh, handle their first half, especially with that turnover in the red zone that allowed. Uh, them to take over in their own territory did the uh, did the Giants but at the same time the Cowboys not necessarily a outstanding win but a win nonetheless and you know how those dif- how difficult those are to get in the National Football League no you're absolutely right KG and that's the thing I kind of felt like that there really wasn't much rhythm offensively for the Cowboys to start that game you know and, and what's funny is that if that would have turned into a game where Dak Prescott in the first half, just like what we saw in Tampa, where it, it was constantly throwing the ball and there was no running game. That might have been a bit of a problem for the Cowboys in that football game. Dak didn't start off particularly well. Uh, you mentioned the turnovers. Kellen Moore, we talk about, I just mentioned about the rhythm. The one thing that helped get that team back on rhythm, though, was the running game. You know, And that's the one thing they've been able to lean on whether it's Ezekiel Elliott, Tony Pollard, you know, they went in with the mindset, okay, we're going to try and get the ball on the edge. We're going to go at Bradbury, the corner. I was talking with Giants scouts before the game, and they were telling me, listen, Dory Jackson on the other side hasn't been tackling very well at all. As a whole, the Giants defense had not been tackling very well. So, you know, for the Cowboys to move the ball and take it to the outside, and what they're trying to do is, they're running the ball to the right side, and you think, wow, they're running behind Steele. He must be doing great. Well, Steele's able, when, they, when they're when they pulling guys, he's able to angle block down. And I watched it again this morning. It's not Steele having to reach and hold a block and hold a block. It's he angles, you get two pullers, you get a wide receiver block, and now the ball is on the outside. And so my point is the running game got the Cowboys back into their offensive rhythm and Kellen Moore, it kind of settled Dak Prescott down a little bit. Some of the throws that they made inside to Dalton Schultz, you know, it, it, that that kind of helped him get going. They sorted out some things protection-wise, but it really the big part of that, as I mentioned, was that Cowboys running game. It kind of got him going in there, uh, mainly in that second half. It's interesting because the Cowboys ran for 201 yards, and you were talking about you know, Terrence Steele and Zach Martin and Connor Williams. What was interesting is I think it was maybe two or three times I went back and watched. You could tell that getting Connor Williams out on the edge, pulling right. him, Zach Martin. There is nothing scarier or prettier in the National Football League than watching Zach Martin put a cornerback in the next week because he did that on multiple occasions in that game yeah. against the Giants. It felt no, like. you're right. You're right. Yeah, KG. And what happens when you run those plays, it's all what we call reach blocks. And on the, on the front side, everybody's reaching to the side of the play. <clears throat> Excuse me. Everybody's reaching the front side. On the back side, you're scooping. And so what that means is you're getting the center up on the second level, and you're getting those guys to pull. 
And now you've got lighter guys on the edge. Unless you have an alley player or somebody that's going to fill that strong safety spot, that's cornerbacks out there trying to make plays. <laughs> and you're right. Yeah. 312 pounds, Zach Martin out there in space, Connor Williams out there in space. You know, and you've got the Cowboy wide receivers. If you go back and look at the way that they run the football, and, and, and Amari Cooper talks about this on 105.3 with us, some of those big runs they have are wide receivers blocking down the field. You know, you've got guys like Coop who's banged up, uh, Cedric Wilson, Noah Brown, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, uh, you, you see CD kind of like fighting with guys and stuff. Mm-hmm. So everybody's bought into Tony Pollard and Zeke running the football, but it's just a different way. It's like they went in with a plan that the Giants – They could help steal, get the ball on the edge, and make the Giants' corners have to to play in the game. And the Giants' corners didn't want any part of that. And, and again, give Kellen Moore a lot of credit and the offensive staff for finding weaknesses and saying, okay, we need to attack this guy. We need to attack this position group. That's what they've been doing here the last four games for sure. And they did it in the Tampa game. They found mm-hmm. some things that just, you know, at the end of the day, they were playing against the all-time great quarterback. And, you know, it ended up the way it was. The Cowboys account for 515 total yards of offense. They go 8 of 14 on third down, which I thought was extremely important, especially in the second half to keep some drives alive. And, of course, we would be remiss if we did not mention Trayvon Diggs comes up with his sixth interception in five games. He now has nine interceptions in his last 10 games played. He's been absolutely tremendous. You heard Troy Aikman on the broadcast talk about Deion Sanders-like with Trayvon Diggs. What did you see on that particular play that's got everybody talking about Trayvon Diggs and his play continuing to be stellar at the cornerback position? Yeah, KG, the scout's eye on that one is that, you know, what, what Diggs is able to do that a lot of cornerbacks have trouble with is to track a football. You know, you have to have the ability. How many times have we seen receivers and defensive backs on a vertical ball or a ball deep across the middle where hand fighting, hand fighting, you're kind of, you're trying to fight and you're looking for the ball and Mm -hmm. they don't find the ball. The official throws the flag. You get a pass interference, defensive holding. You know, something always happens that way. With Diggs, it's like he, the way he plays his routes is, There might be some initial separation. Then he reads the route, but his ability to read the route and then take his eyes and look and find the ball has been key. If you look at the Giants, the Giants receiver on that play wasn't even close, was in no position. Diggs actually ran the route better than the (laughs) receiver at that time. And so, you know, that's where I kind of feel like, though, that's the advantage that Diggs has. He plays with his eyes. He knows about positioning. He he has a little bit of a burst. You watch that separation. He was able to close some ground. I don't think Diggs is a 40-yard burst run guy for time. I think he's a see it, you know, uh, find it, see it, and then burst, and then go get that ball played at high point. His ball skills, his ability to finish is outstanding. I mean, you you can you can put clinic reels together about the way that he plays the ball down the field. And you could put clinic reels together about how he plays routes underneath. The physicality, you know, if you if you look and before Galladay got hurt and you rewatched the game, you said they try and drag Galladay across the middle and throw him the ball. He Dixon almost got that the one. First interception. But what does he do? <laughs> when, as a scout, when you're evaluating, if you find a corner that can play inside routes, the slants, those things that break across. They tried to run him through trash, avoid the trash, avoid the picks, then get in position to knock the ball down or play the ball underneath. That's rare. That is really, really rare that you have that feel for how to navigate, position yourself, burst, and then come up with a finish. So not only playing the vertical ball, but playing the stuff underneath, man. You get me a corner that can do both those things, though, you got a pretty special kid doing that. It's interesting because Diggs said after the game, he was in tears when Nick Saban said, hey, I want to move you from wide receiver to corner because I think you'd be really good at it. Trayvon Diggs looks back now and says, yeah, I'm glad Saban did that for me because it's worked out pretty good for him. Yeah, my experience of going and scouting at the University of Alabama with Nick Saban as the coach 
is that Nick Saban is the secondary coach at Alabama. So you now you know why. I mean, how many how many times have we worked on the draft, KG, and there's always an Alabama corner or safety or somebody that we <laughs> yeah. have to look at? And a lot of that has to do with the fact that Nick Saban, Nick Saban coaches that position. He's the head coach and he coaches the secondary at Alabama. Those kids are well coached. Nick Saban, longtime defensive coordinator, longtime secondary coach. You know, he knows how to play the position. You know, and you're right, Diggs, you know, I mean, but give Diggs credit for going in there. Now, I'll say this, though, when they were, it was, it's so interesting how the draft sometimes work. And this is a little insight for our program. Talking to the scouts over there, the coaches were really, really, really talking about, you know, with, you know, with a guy like, for a guy, example, just to give you an example, J.C. Horn. Coaches love a guy, and this is the previous draft. Mm-hmm. They love a guy like J.C. Horn because he's kind of a gambler, a risk taker, that kind of thing. But then they're talking about Sertan in a way, an Alabama corner, steady, big game player, techniques, all these things. Scouts were thinking, give me the safe guy. Coaches want the gambler, you know. But what you got in Diggs and Stephen Jones even admitted this to us, if they got wiped out in that C.D. Lamb draft where C.D. not there, Diggs could have very well been that pick at 17 for the Cowboys. Mm -hmm. They thought that much of him. So – those Alabama players, very steady, very co- coach well on techniques, played in huge games. These are all things you have to love about when you evaluate those players. Well, Diggs continues to be the beneficiary of that terrific coaching of Nick Saban and taking it to another level now with the secondary. Al Harris, the secondary coach, loving what he's seeing from Joe Witt, too. Joe Witt mm-hmm. doing a great job, too, as well, coaches. Him and Al Harris have got that crew playing pretty well right now. And even Anthony Brown on the other side. Anthony mm-hmm. Brown had a chance for an interception. Anthony Brown's played three really good games in a row now. Guy like myself kind of threw a lot of dirt on Anthony Brown. Not really Same sure here. About him. Same here. <laughs> you know, not really sure about him, Jordan Lewis, and all those guys. You know, I mean, they, they drafted Kelvin Joseph for a reason. They knew they needed help at corner. But you know what? To, to Anthony Brown's credit, he is lined up and he's played very well. He, he, you talk about Diggs on an interception run. Could have been back-to-back games for Brown if he would got that one last week against Carolina. Just didn't finish with his hands. The Cowboys were able to clean up some of the turnovers and mistakes in the second half. Turnover free in the second half. Would be remiss if we didn't mention, obviously, the New York Giants were extremely banged up. Uh, Daniel Jones suffered a concussion, had to leave the game. Saquon Barkley suffered uh, a terribly sprained uh, left ankle. Also, Kenny Galladay, Kenny Galladay, excuse me, eventually left with a knee injury. Uh, so the Giants were banged up as the game went on. But we know the game of the NFL, it's a war of attrition. And at times you're going to be playing teams are going to be banged up. Uh, it was interesting on the Jones play. It almost looked like and I wonder if you saw the same thing. It almost looked like Jones initiated the contact. Yeah. With yeah. Jabril Cox on that particular play that allowed, you know, Cox to keep him from getting in the end zone there. Well, one thing, KG, to talk about all those injuries. And, and by the way, they lost Tony at the end of the game for throwing That's a right. punch. And mm-hmm. so, you know, it, it was just a bad day all around for the Giants. You know, the people of the Giants will say, oh, that was a dirty hit by Cox. It was dirty play and all that. No, it, it's not. And, you know, if Dak Prescott would have been in that situation – I would have said the same thing because to me, you're a quarterback, you're outside the pocket, you're running with the football, you're trying to score. My job is to keep you out of the end zone, not worry about your safety on that tackle. You know, when Dak Prescott got hurt, you know, last year, they were not worried about his safety on when he was out there running the ball. They were thinking, how do we get this big son of a gun on the ground? You know, and Daniel Jones has shown through the first five weeks of the season, he is a capable runner with the football. Jabril Cox did exactly what he has to do to keep a ball carrier, whether it's a running back, a wide receiver, a tight end, or a quarterback, out of the end zone. That is a football play. Quarterback, you're a runner. You're trying to score. My job is to keep you out. If the shoe was on the other foot with Dak Prescott, it's a football play. That's all you could say. And I thought what was interesting that, you know, the Giants eventually scored on that drive. Yeah. But I thought Micah Parsons and Jabril Cox on first through third down on those plays 
were absolutely special. I thought Micah Parsons, especially in the run game, it seemed like was really getting after these tailbacks and quarterbacks of the New York Giants. And it's interesting to see how he continues to be as versatile as he is, whether it be getting after the passer. But in this game, it felt like he participated a lot more in the run game and made some key stops in this game. It felt he did. Like. You're absolutely right, KG. There was more linebacker play this week. And I think a lot of it had to do with going in the game plan. They were prepared for Saquon Barkley mm-hmm. to come in and try and run the football. You know, Jason Garrett, that's, that's really what he wants to do. He wants to try and stay ahead of the chains and run the ball and, and you know, control that, you know, that aspect of it. So Micah Parsons was – once the Christie Scales told us in our pregame show that Parsons had the green dot on his helmet for communication purposes, mm-hmm. I said he's a linebacker today. This is about yeah. linebacker. This is about physicality at the point of attack. This is about running downhill. This is about – Penn State on Penn State crime is what this was going to be, <laughs> that's you know, right. and yeah. you know that that's really, I mean, you know, for the Giants, unfortunately, they lost their their one of their best players. For the Cowboys, they were prepared, they were ready, and they were ready with Micah Parsons playing as that Mike linebacker. Give Jabril Cox. I think there's a ton of pressure since the release of of Jalen Smith. Jabril Cox is going to have to play in more nickel roles. That's just the way it's going to be. You mm-hmm. know, it's going to be a lot of nickel too when with with uh, with Parsons, with Neal, those guys playing. But there's going to be times where it's Parsons and Cox playing. And I think if you look at the plays that Cox was able to make, and let's not forget the onside kick that the Giants tried or attempted, Cox made the recovery on that. Mm-hmm. So that shows you they have faith in the kid to go up in a big, big, big way and make a play. So, yeah, not a bad, not a bad day for him right out of the blocks. I think it was only a couple of tackles. But at least you noticed number 14 on the field yesterday when he was out there in a positive way, not in a negative way. Before we move to our stars of the game, a couple other notes from this particular game. Ezekiel Elliott surpassing 100 scrimmage yards for the 47th time in his career time. Michael Irvin for the third most games with 100 plus scrimmage yards in team history. Ezekiel Elliott, Tony Pollard, who had 14 carries for 75 yards. The Cowboys now move to 28 and 0 when they have more rushing attempts than passing attempts. It's, it's funny because we it feels like we keep seeing that week over week, but the ground game continues to be stellar. The Cowboys carry the ball 39 times for 201 yards, averaging 5.2 yards per carry. The physicality of this offensive line allowing these running backs to get out in space has been a big story, especially over the last several weeks. You've talked about it on the G-Bag Nation, the lighter boxes that the Cowboys have been seeing over the past several weeks. And they are making a concerted effort, it feels like, to really establish the run game. But basing that off of the passing game, it took a little while for the passing game to get going. But as you mentioned earlier, the running game is what really stabilized this offense and allowed that passing game to eventually come on, especially in the second half, it felt like. Yeah, KG, that's why I think my stars of the game. I mean, you could even say the collective group with the offensive line, those five guys up front, you know, and and just think about what's happened. You've won four straight games with with Terrence Steele playing at right tackle, you know, and, and and give him a lot of credit for what he's been able to do. You know, they were smart. They knew it. The, the, the coaches had a plan. They knew they knew they had to try and help Tyler Biotish at center. That's a whole nother podcast for us to talk about another day. <laughs> but right now, I think you could give the offensive line you know, like the star of the game as a group. But this, it's really is these backs. It, it's you know, it's Ezekiel Elliott not practicing all week, dealing with knee soreness and going out there, the physicality, which he played with. I mean, the only time he got knocked out, it was because of a pylon, you know, a camera pylon, it got him in the back and knocked him out for a play. But you, you look at Pollard, you look at Elliott, the way that they're running the football, that, that was the group yesterday that gave the Cowboys stability when things were kind of going a little wonky for him, you know, that back, the fumbles, whatever, that kind of brought things back together and everybody's like, okay, now let's start. It's second and four. Let's start doing this. Oh, it's second and three. Let's start doing this. Oh, by the way, it's uh, it's first and 20 after a penalty, and we're going to get 17 yards on a run. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. the running game was the, the big, big factor, I think, to make it to give this offense some stability and, and to get it back on track where they can have that Dak, good Dak Prescott rhythm, the throw that he made to CeeDee Lamb the ability to separate, all that just because of the Cowboys' ability to run the football uh, to get them back in rhythm that game. I thought, for me, one of my stars of the game, which is funny because 
he didn't have a tackle, didn't have a sack. But I thought Randy Gregory on yeah. Sunday gave Nate Solder the absolute business. Solder was in for Andrew Thomas, who didn't play at right. left tackle on Sunday. But I thought Randy Gregory had a fantastic day. The amount of pressure that he was putting on the quarterback, collapsing the pocket. I thought Randy Gregory had a fantastic day. I hope at some point he continues to be able to capitalize and get sacks based on the pressure that he's getting. But I thought Randy Gregory was all over the field on Sunday afternoon for the Cowboys. Yeah, I think you're right, KG. And again, with Randy, it's not always going to be about the sacks. It's going to be about the pressure. How is he going to attack the pocket? Dan Quinn has done a, a really nice job. The defensive staff had done. There's been previous administrations here, Cowboy coaching staffs that have not taken advantage of players that are weak on the other team. They just haven't, you know, and now with Dan Quinn, it's almost like he's taken my old job, the, the advanced <laughs> scout. And when the advanced scout comes in and says, listen, Nate Soldar needs to be attacked in this game. He is the weak link or the guard is the weak link. The Cowboys are attacking the weak link, and it's making that work. And I think that's the thing that I'm the, I have to be the most happy for for that for that team is because there was a time that that wouldn't happen. It would just okay, let's line up, you know, play the run on the way to the pass, run, run, run. You know, I get it. <laughs> yeah. You know, for for Tampa Bay, in you know, if we win a Super Bowl back in the day. Yeah, it was great. Simeon Rice, Booger McFarland, Warren Sapp, you know, Derek Brooks. Yeah, you could get away playing like that because you were just that good, Tampa Bay, back in the day. But now it's more like, okay, let's attack this guy. Let's attack that guy. Let's attack this guy. You know, and I, I think that's the thing that's been the most, most, most pleasing to me. And you can even see a little bit in the offensive game plan with the ball kept going to the outside. Mm -hmm. They felt like they had something there with those corners that they would not attack the run. They wouldn't attack the run. And now every cornerback that watches this film in the National Football League that's an opponent of the Cowboys is like, oh, damn it. I've got to play <laughs> against pulling guards. No, no, I, I no, I don't want to play against pulling guards. Right, you know? right. So that's that. They're Kellen Moore sent a very vivid picture to the rest of the league about the Cowboys running game. Other stars in the game for me, uh, give credit to Dak Prescott. Overcame a slow start, had a couple of miscues with the turnovers. One was a terrific play, play by Lorenzo Carter on the tip pass and was able yeah. to get the interception there. Or Zeke was open, too. <laughs> he was open in the flat. You're exactly right. Yeah. And had some green turf out in front of him. The second one, obviously not handling the snap well, took his eyes off the ball as the ball was coming in, uh, maybe trying to do a little too much before actually securing the ball. But give him credit in the second half. At one point, had three touchdown passes and four drives. Dak Prescott, nearly one year to the day. In fact, as we're recording this, it's the one-year, quote-unquote, anniversary, if you will, of uh, Dak Prescott suffering that ankle injury last year against the Giants. And he even talked about it after the game. He's like, look, it was weighing on my mind, you know, pretty pretty heavily. But as after I threw that touchdown pass to CeeDee Lamb, things kind of settled in for him. And you could tell, especially he gained that rhythm in the second half and allowed himself to play a good football game and continue the role that he's been on through the first five yeah, weeks of the season. Yeah, these receivers. I mean, these receivers have done a really nice job. I, I guarantee there's going to be a podcast that we're going to have coming up here real soon talking about where's Michael Gallup fit in all this stuff again. I was, I was I about mean, to say, Cedric there, there, Wilson's there's, there's playing really be, good. Yeah. There's going to be some guys coming back from injury that you're going to say, give them their job back, or is it mm, – Kind of work back because Cedric Let's Wilson's earned it. To, to, to your Gallup point, Cedric Wilson's yeah. earned it. He's earned it Cedric at this point. Wilson, Brown, the mm -hmm. tight ends, the way they've played, they're making more than making up. I, I love Michael Gallup. Don't get me wrong, but they they've they're you know they've made this thing work. They really have. It just it shows you. But you know, look on the defensive side of the ball too. You know, Neville Gallimore is going to be back here soon. At, probably mm -hmm. after the ball. Donovan Wilson's going to come back after the bye. I mean, there's there's some guys that are they're looking at their jobs and they're like, I don't know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's nice to have them back, but are you going to take them out? I think the only one that just immediately plugs right back in is probably Lyle Collins. I, I think that's mm -hmm. the one that you yeah. just say, you know, and and hopefully as we tape this on a Monday, uh, that we'll get some word uh, from. Uh, 
Judge Marzant in Sherman, Texas, about you might you might have Lyle Collins back. And again, as you and I do these podcasts during the week here, we'll probably get more into that of what that dynamic might be coming with all these guys coming back. Definitely. We'll have you up to date here on 105 through the fan here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe here to uh, 105 through the fan on YouTube. Hit that notifications button. So, you know, when the episodes drop, you'll be able to know exactly what's going on. So I look again, not the cleanest game from the Cowboys, but I think these kinds of games, as we get ready to open the broadest files here, I think these are the kinds of games that good teams like this have to win anyway, despite overcoming some some bad turnovers, some sloppy play. They were able to stick with it and eventually in the second half be able to put things away. And I thought for them, kind of a gut check when you never know what happens in a rivalry game. Sometimes things get a little wonky, but at the same time, I thought the Cowboys acquitted themselves well again in the second half and being able to handle their business and get the win accordingly. So let's go ahead and open up the broadest files here. Some notes or things or thoughts from you that's particularly stuck out to you that we may not have been privy to as the game was going on that you really saw that really had an effect on this game. Yeah, KG, we've covered a lot of ground on this podcast already, what we saw. Brian Anger, the punter, has become a weapon. You know, I mean, now, unfortunately, the Cowboys gave up an 88-yard drive after mm-hmm. his punt. Mm-hmm. With a 61-yard punt, and, and it put the Giants in a hole – and if somehow you get a stop and get the ball back with C.D. Lamb returning it, you know, 18 yards, and you're now in, you know, the opponent's territory and that thing easy scores. You know, there was a time when this punting situation, you know, it was good at one point. Injury, you know, with, with Chris Jones, and then it kind of, you know, back and forth. But, you know, give the Cowboys credit. You know, give Bones Fossil. I've been very critical of Bones Fossil. But give him credit for going out and understanding what Brian Anger could bring to this to this team. This guy is a weapon. Uh, You know, when you watch him punt, not only the hang time, the distance, the direction, these are kinds of things that those hidden yards that people don't always talk about, whether it's penalties, you know, turnovers, whatever it is. But, you know, that's that's where you have to take advantage of if you have that type of thing. You also have to take advantage of if teams miss field goals. Mm -hmm. To me, a missed field goal is like a turnover. You know, the Cowboys had the tip ball that went for an interception. Okay, what do they do? They get a stop. They get a missed field goal. They get the ball back in that similar situation where they're at. To me, missed field goals are like turnovers. Good job by the Cowboys playing some defense right there. Hidden yards, KG, hidden yards, you know, whether it's these penalties whether it's the punt return, the kick returns, or the punter able to pin opponents in their own in the field. I think with, you know, we, we again, very critical of Bones Fossil and a lot of things he's done, but you watch the way the guys like Cedric Wilson's covered, uh, you know, uh, CJ, those guys with the way they've been able to cover uh, on these things. And then, you know, hopefully the kicking situation where it doesn't come down to a missed extra point or something like that. So far, so good for the Cowboys. I think two notes for me, one on the offensive side, one on the defensive side. I'll start on the defensive side. The versatility of Osa Digizua to me continues to impress me. You've seen him line up in the interior, saw him line up out on the edge. He's creating pressure wherever he's been placed on this defensive line. And I think that's a large credit to Dan Quinn and his ability to recognize what he's got in his young interior lineman there and recognizing that, hey, there's multiple ways that I can help this guy get pressure on the quarterback. And he's continuing to help his guys around him make plays. I thought Osa Digizua, again, was another standout with the way that he's creating pressure on the defensive line. And I would be remiss if we didn't talk about real quick the play design on that Zeke Elliott touchdown with the little fake handoff, the little yeah. Tony Pollard running across the formation, and then Dak being able to dump it off you know, to Zeke for him to high step it into the touchdown. I thought was beautifully created by Kellen Moore and obviously one of the plays of the game that had folks talking. Kellen Moore has really continued to put himself in a position where he's dialing up things that just seem like everything's working for him in this offense at this point. And I guess you could do that when you've got really talented players on the offense to be able to scheme some things up against these guys. Yeah, some of the some of the best play callers KJ have ever been around. Guys like John Gruden, 
guys like Andy Reid, people like that, they always stole ideas. They always like watched other people's tape, whether it was college football, NFL football, heck, even high school football. You might get a player to like, man, that would work pretty good if we can just do this. We could tweak it to make it do this. So, yeah, the, the great play callers are the ones, the ability to study and then the ability to steal and then apply. So Kellen Moore's done all the above. The staff, Doug Nussmeyer, those guys. Doug Nussmeyer with a college background, you know, he has an idea of some of those things. So, yeah, even the throwback, even the pass they threw to Cedric Wilson, the mm-hmm. lateral that ended up being a pass down the field, well-designed, well-timed. You know, it's just a shame. It's like it's almost like Wilson caught the ball and had trouble – setting it in his hands yeah. and then he couldn't right quite get the grip like he needed you know Cedric Wilson can't take off his right glove you know that's a, just a dead <laughs> giveaway so he's got to and throw he had CD Lamb on, streaking right. down the sideline yeah. too for a yeah. yeah. wide open touchdown yeah. pass too. Hey, hey, hey KG before we get out of here I want to, one thing real quick about mm-hmm. Diggs I want to talk about I got into discussion with Des Bryant during the game on Twitter yeah and we were talking about Des says, man, and I noticed that he goes, man, he goes, you, they're going to learn. Don't throw it at Diggs. Don't throw <laughs> it at Diggs. And I asked, I said, Des, he's carrying your be- the best receiver. Okay, he's carrying you in a game. Do I not throw it to you? And he goes, no, man, no, no. That's a different story. <laughs> that's, that's dog on dog. <laughs> that's dog on dog right there. So, yeah, yeah you know, Des is like, man, they're going to learn. But I'm like, wait a minute, Des, I'm <laughs> going to find a way to get you the ball. And he's like, no, yeah, right, dog on dog. So, yeah, uh-huh. it was uh, had a little fun with it. But, yeah, it's uh, you know, team's playing pretty well. When you win a game, it's easy to make the corrections. You could be – I remember Bill Parcells being with him. When you win, the coaches can be a little harder on you about the, about the corrections, the fumbles. What happened with Tyler Biotish at center, we'll get into that another day. Mm -hmm. But, you know, those are things. But when you lose, maybe a little bit more compassion about, okay, it's fine. Don't beat them up as bad kind of a thing. And, you know, sometimes coaches do it the opposite way. So winning games are good teaching opportunities for some of those mistakes we saw in the first half. As we wrap up here, looking forward to Wednesday's episode, because you and Ari Timken made some interesting points during the post game that I think going forward, as I think expectations start to get raised for this team, how we view this defense relative to the teams that they've played in terms of their offenses, but also what this team will look like against better quarterbacks as the season goes on and into the playoffs. Because I think now the conversation, I think has to start to shift that we, we feel like this team is going to be, they're going to make the playoffs, but now what do championship aspirations look like? And can this defense be much better going into what will be better competition as the season go on and deep, hopefully, into the playoffs. So really looking forward to getting into that conversation as the week goes on, because I think that's something that I think Cowboys fans really have to start thinking about in terms of this defense, not just what they do week over week, but what does this team look like as the season goes on to give them a better idea that, hey, maybe this team could make a deep playoff run that they uh, that they hope for. Yeah, you just, you know, the whole thing is about health, it's about, you know, about correcting mistakes, limiting mistakes, and then the ability to execute out there. I know that was a buzzword that Jason Garrett always used, but, you know, offensively and defensively, for the most part, in special teams, they're executing. They're doing a good job of, you know, taking the game plan, advancing the game plan. Coaches are on a good roll on both sides of the ball, you know, and that's it just needs to keep rolling in that direction, you know, and there'll be better quarterbacks down the line. You know, I mean, this we're getting to the New England game, I'm sure, this week. And, you know, Mm -hmm. Mac Jones for a rookie quarterback is has done a pretty nice job. He really, really has. And, you know, so we'll see. And then there's, you know, Kirk Cousins, who's kind of been a cowboy. He doesn't always win against the Cowboys, but he seems to throw for like 400 yards every time he (laughs) plays against them. So, you know, there's these games coming up, Matt Ryan and and Mahomes and guys like Mm -hmm. that. I think you'll have an even a better understanding of, of where you're at defensively once you navigate uh, those games. That wraps up episode number three of the Boys Collective right here on 105 Through the Fan here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to 105 Through the Fan on YouTube. Hit that notifications bell so you know when the episodes drop. 
We will be doing this three times a week, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, recapping the game from the previous week, getting you news and notes on what's going on and insights with America's team on Wednesdays. And then Fridays, getting you ready for the next game coming up this week. The Cowboys will be visiting, of course, Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots. So we'll definitely be getting into that as the haven't week goes won, on. Haven't beaten New England in New England since 1987. Raymond Berry was the coach that day for the, <laughs> wow. the Patriots. <laughs> Think about that. I was I was get just about graduated from LSU at that time. So that and then old Chris well, is 57 <laughs> years old now. So that tells you how long it's been. Your boy was one years old. One years old. <laughs> if you want gotcha. to build, there you go. Gotcha. <laughs> Brian Broaddus, appreciate the time as always. Looking forward to the Wednesday episode. And this again was episode number three of the Boys Collective. Brian, appreciate it. We'll talk to you on Wednesday. Look forward to it, KG. You take care. Appreciate it.